this lecture in security system. We discuss on Java cryptography. When you develop secure software, you should learn, especially you should learn Java. Java is kind of secure software development language. Since Java run on top of virtual machine, some of the problems such as buffer flow attacks and few other serious attacks which software usually face may not available or may not possible when you are when you develop software using Java, Java language is to be considered as secure programming language. So we should learn how to use Java to develop secure codes, especially this lecture and my new lecture. I'll explain how to use Java to develop cryptographic applications. While you are developing software, you need to learn how to handle cryptography as well. First of all, let's study anatomy of Java application. Usually, we can see three types of Java classes available. What we call it as local classes, remote classes, and Zion Java classes. Local classes works in the local machine, while remote classes we call remotely. Zion classes works in the browser. Usually, you know, we are very rarely use sign Java classes. So, we focus on local classes where most of us used to now use now. When you execute a Java program or the local Java class, first of all, it goes through module, call it as bytecode verifier. Bytecode verifier verifies the integrity of the class. Then it's put it into a module called class loader. Class loader loads the class into a VM. Then each and every instruction in this class will pass us to the core Java API. Java API execute this Java instructions or Java virtual machine instructions one after other. Before executing those instructions, they pass those to the security manager. This security manager check the access rights of the instructions. So they check with the operating system access rights, plus they check with the Java itself, what you call it as access controls. So this security manager also connect with the security key database. We learn those when we move on. Basically, each and every instruction need to be clear by it security manager before execute it in a Java virtual machine. Especially when you know it's remote Java classes, they run in restricted environments. So that environment you should call it as Java sandbox. So those Java sandbox may not be able to access the local resources. 
So at present, uh, remote Java classes or whatever, Java app plugins are rarely used. So we are not going to discuss this in, in detail in this course anymore. When you consider the language itself, as I mentioned, Java considered to be a secure programming development language. So this language itself has four access modifiers, as you, may, as you might know. Private, default, protected, and public are those access modifiers. When you put public, so these Java objects or attributes can be accessed by any class. When you put protected, so access within the class, package or subclass of the class. If you don't put anything, so we call it as default modifier. So then these objects and the attributes can be accessed within the package. So when you declare them as private, you should know the access only within the class. So by, by putting one of these access modifiers, we can restrict access to Java classes as well as Java attributes. As I mentioned, Java inherently puts some security to their objects. So they are allowed arbitrary accessing the memory locations of your machines. They initialize variables automatically. So they basically release the memory if they are not using it. It's automatically checked the array boundaries. That stop definitely that stop stack overflow, buffer uh, overflow attacks. And when we, we can define objects with final, so then nobody will be able to extend those objects later on. Java also, Java not support pointers as you know, because of that. So people will not be able to arbitrary accessing memory areas while using Java programs, while you are using Java programs. So language enforce some security at different levels in its life cycle. So in the first, what we do, we compile the program. So there they check the syntax of the programming language. As you know, if the syntax are wrong, it's not allowed to compile the program. So then it enter into the stage of bytecode verifier that checks the illegal conversion stack overflow and the flows, and whether it extends the final classes or not, and other formatting things. So the class passes the bytecode verification. Finally, it enters the runtime environment. At the runtime environment, it checks their boundaries. So if someone is trying to access the data outside of these arrays, you know, it throws the exceptions. And it also checks the object casting. So the programmer may not be able to take care of those. So language itself stop such illegal access at the runtime. So due to all of this, we consider Java language as secure software development language. The main objective of these lectures is to discuss how to use Java, especially to implement cryptographic applications. So in order to do that, Java provides a security API. Java security API has, has a very interesting architecture. This architecture will give us a lot of flexibility where we can 
implement our own algorithms as well. However, those flexibilities, on the other hand, open the security holes. So while we are using this Java cryptographic and security APIs, we need to be careful of these things. Java security architecture consists of several packages. Their main package is called Java security package. So it has access control package, digital certificate or set package, and Java interface package and specification package. Using interfaces and specifications, we could customize the algorithm specifications Plus, we can implement our own algorithms. So, major cryptographic operations of this our applications implemented by Java Crypto Extension, or now we call it as Java Cryptographic Architecture. Java Cryptographic Architecture implements all necessary cryptographic algorithms for our day-to-day -day use. Unfortunately, some of these algorithms, cryptographic algorithms, has royalty and also has export restrictions. Because of that, those algorithms are not implemented by Oracle Java version. So either you have to use open source implementation or open JDK like uh, Java implementation, or else you have to add a third party security implementation or algorithm implementation to this cryptographic architecture. Java cryptographic architecture designed in such a way people can add their own algorithms to this Java architecture or JCA. As I mentioned, JC has a couple of classes for doing data encryption, decryption, calculating and verification of hashing, and also for key generations. Implementation of the algorithm in this case is independent from the Java versions. So it's interoperable in between different platforms and algorithm can also be extensive, extensible. Algorithms are extensible. So some of those algorithms are implemented. If you wish, you can extend those algorithms and customize them. Or else you can have new algorithms implemented. So Java cryptographic architecture is flexible enough to do it. So that flexibility might open security holes. So we will discuss that while we move on. Implementation of Java security or cryptographic algorithms, call it as security platforms. So by default, Java development and runtime environments comes with several such security platforms. Those security platforms sometimes implement the same algorithms. So we need to be careful while we are using those platforms. So we should pick our algorithms from the correct platforms. By default, we can forget about the platform and just call the algorithms. So if you call that, it will get the implementation in order. We will discuss it in a minute. So if, if you're interested, you can implement your own security provider or the cryptographic provider, which consists of your own set of algorithms. So there you need to implement what you call it as engine class and then algorithm classes, security provider class, and obviously 
class called security class. We will learn in short how to write on our own security provider as well. As I mentioned, so all the implementation of cryptographic algorithms bundled into a Java security provider class. Security provider class consists of cryptographic engine classes and the algorithm classes. So you can permanently add those security providers into your Java development environment or runtime environment, or you can dynamically add them and remove them. So those things we learn. The default Java engine class implements all known kind of cryptographic algorithms and their applications. So engine class encapsulates all cryptographic data to be processed. Default cryptographic engine class supports random number generation, hash or the message digest calculations, data signature generations, data encryption and decryption, and also message, calculating message authentication codes. There are classes available to customize the key generator. So there are two types of key generators available. All it has sacred key generator and the key pair generator. So if you use symmetric key cryptographic algorithms, so we use sacred key factory or the sacred key generator classes. In case of public key cryptography, we must use key pair generator class. Java engine class also supports a key exchange algorithms as well. So in, in, in case you want to create your own algorithms, or own key generators, so you, you have you, Java given some supports using its certificate factories, certificate path builder, validator, and store classes. So those classes may be used in the public key certificates. As I mentioned, in order to handle our own algorithms, so there are classes available to adjust the algorithm parameters. And there are there are there is a class to access key stores. As I mentioned, we can add those implementation of Java cryptographic provider into the Java development environment in two methods by using two methods. In the first method, we can permanently add that. So in your Java environment, there is a file called java.security file. You can easily locate it under Java home directory in the subdirectory called lab and security. Inside that, you can see a text file called java.security file. So this test file consists of all the security parameters of Java platform. You can have a look on these parameters. The important parameter who handles the, which it handles, important parameter which handles the security providers is down here. So for example, usually when you check that file, there might there might be six, seven security providers installed by default in your Java virtual machine. 
So those security providers no name is security.provider1, security.provider2, security.provider3, and so on. After the equal sign, it provides the package name, like Sun Security Provider Sun, and so on. So if you have your own security provider, you can add to the bottom of the list an equal sign and the package name. So in addition to that, we can uh, we can dynamically add the security providers into our applications. I'll show you later on how those things happen. So in case you want to write your own program, where it lists down the security providers installed in your applications. So you need to code it like here. So first of all, you need to import the necessary libraries for the necessary classes, packages. So they are security provider class and java.security class. So then you call the method get provider in the security class. As you may notice, so the security class is a static class. Most of the Java security and cryptographic classes are static class. So that means you can call the methods available in this class without initiating this class. Just using the class name and dot methods and call the methods. So that's possible because most of these classes are static classes. So Java, sec Java security dot security static class has a method called get provider. You call this get providers method. It returns the byte array. It consists of installed security providers. So by calling each provider, by calling the methods in each provider object, we can get the additional information like get name gives the name of this provider, get information gives display the more information, and get version displays the version number, and so on. In case you want to check the algorithms implemented in these providers, you need to call the provider.entry set method. That returns the all implemented algorithms bundles in this particular security provider. As I mentioned, so there are several security providers by default installed in your Java virtual machine. In addition to that, you can install your own security provider as well. So applications calls the methods available in those provider framework then provider framework loads the implementation from the di different implementations available to the VM. So let's assume there are three providers installed in your machine called provider A, provider B, and provider C. They have a different cryptographic algorithms implemented. So our application, let's say our, one of our applications need MD5 hashing to its kind of saving a password or whatever its operations in the application there. So then you have to call a method called get digest. We'll explain that with the name of the algorithm. So here in this example, I'm looking for message digest version 5 implementation. So when I call that from the provider framework, it search through the existing providers to find it out whether they have the implementation of MD5. So in this example, so in the first provider, or the provider A may not have the MD5 implementation. If so, KVM automatically search for the second provider or the provider B to get this implementation. So as shown in this example, 
provided B has the MD5 implementation, so it returns to the application. So then application can use it in the app. Similarly, sometimes we want to pick that implementation from the particular point, rather let the Java to search existing code. That is much better. So if you want to get the specific implementation from the specific provider, so you have to call the method with the algorithm name you want, and then next parameter you need to tell from which provider you need, or which from which vendor you need. So then it goes to a particular provider and loads there. So for example, I'm looking for MD5. So the provider B has this implementation. So if you call the algorithms in a regular way, so it's loads. MD5 implementation of the provider B. However, if you provide the, or you given the name of the provider like here in the provider C, so you are too specific, the good, you specify the provider you need. So then your application loads this implementation of MD5 from the provider C. So that's how it works. As I mentioned, we're going to use a, we're going to use a specific cryptographic implementation called Bouncy Castle. So you can download this from the website called bouncycastle.org. So it has a third-party implementation of most popular cryptographic algorithms. So after you download it, you can copy that archive file into the Java form library extension for the ext directory by doing that. You can let other people to access this implementation. So after that, you edit a file which I mentioned, that is Java security file, located in the Java home lib security. So there you have to give the package name that is org bouncy puzzle package. Right, with that short introduction, I would like to go straight forward to show some demos. So by looking at those demos, you may understand the style of implementing Java cryptographic applications. Let me go to some simple editor by stopping the slides in this stage and I share a simple editor I call Atom Editor uh, to conduct this demonstration. So in this demonstration, I will demonstrate several sample implementations of Java applications or the Java codes. Those codes you can use in your day-to-day -day activities. I don't care if you use those for your own uses, own requirements. All right. First of all, I will show you how many providers installed in your Java virtual environment. For that, I have implemented a class called uh, list provider. So when you carefully have a look on this list provider Java class, it includes necessary APIs or the packages on the top, and then main program starts here. There, what's happened? This is the main goal of the program. I call 
security.providers. It returns me the array of security providers. So you can get each provider from this array and then call the get name, get information, like methods like that. So there you can get the more information about uh, the providers in store. So as you see, so I get the provider array. From that provider array, I iterated the, through the provider array using a for each loop. So each of the, the provider, I call P, I call the get name, get info, and get the version number of each product. Right. Now let's compile and run this program in the atom compiler. There you might see we have several providers installed in this uh, in uh, in this platform. So as you see here, it has uh, it has the Sun implementations. So some of them has key exchange algorithms implemented. Some of them has uh, other standard implementations. Right. There are several other programs which I want to show you. Uh, other one is uh, what we call it as Java. Uh, uh, other one I want to show you how to add those providers and remove them. So I have downloaded the security provider called Bouncy Cousin. If I want to add them into the platform, I need to call security.provider and the object of this particular provider. Then obviously I need to add the job files to the class file. Then I call the get instance method available in the cipher class if I want to do the encryption. And in there I can specifically tell I need the encryption algorithms from this bouncy puzzle by given BC. If I don't give this provider short name while I'm loading the uh, cryptographic algorithms, it search from the beginning to the end, uh, list and end, end of the list of these providers you have. So I, I will compile this and show you that later on. Similarly, I have some examples where I implement own security algorithms. Uh, so those things I will show you later on. Right. Now I will show you how to create random numbers. Usually random numbers used as security keys in our cryptographic applications. So for example, if someone generate, a, uh, someone wants to send a message to someone else. So he needs to encrypt that using a security key. We can use the random number as the key. So in the next message, we can create a next key and so on. So if you are using such sequence of keys, so those keys should be initiated with a random password or what we call it as secure seed. So those, this seed should be shared between sender and the recipient. So this program called uh, my random number uh, shows 
how to create such sequence of random numbers. So in the beginning of the program, I am imp importing Java security package. And then I create a byte array to store the security key. Assume I am using a 256-bit key. So for that, I need to have a byte array 256 divided by 8 to store that key. So this bytes is the key byte. So then I have to get a random number generator. There are several random number generations algorithms available. I just select one of them. Let's call it as SHA1 hashing algorithm based random generator. So as I mentioned, all the classes, cryptographic classes in Java are static classes. So we can call them without in insertiating them. So I call the class name secure random number and the method called get, get instance. Most of the cryptographic operations in Java start with get instance method. And within the get instance methods, we give the parameter. So that parameter is the name of the algorithm we want. So using get instance method, I ask the Java to lo load SHA1 PR ng implementation to my program. So this implementation may this is this 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 algorithm may implemented by several platforms. So since I am not giving the name of the platform as the second parameter to the get instant method, they search in order through the existing providers and loads the first hit from this provider list. So as a result, it returns here the object called secure random generator. So then I want to initiate the random generation with the initial value. So that initial value call it has a seed. So you see for this secure random number object which create here, there is a method available called set seed. I call set seed method of this random generator and pass the initial value to that. So for example, I see my Aisha password one, two, three, four between my sender and the recipient. So I get the bytes out of this my password one, two, three, four. All the cryptographic operations we need to pass bytes strings are not taken by those algorithms. So my password, perhaps the string, so that is one, two, three, four. From that string, I call get bytes methods that returns a byte array. So that byte array is set as the seed of this random generator, or it has SR1. So then in this particular for loop, I create five random numbers. It's initiated by this one, two, three, four C. So in order to get a random number, we need to call next byte method available in this secure random class. So when you call next bytes method by giving a byte array, it returns the byte array random byte bytes or random number and store that, or store that in this bytes. Bytes declares here. So in this for loop, actually I print them in hexadecimal form on the terminal. After that, this outer for loop will continue and call next byte methods. It returns the next random number. And then I call next byte method, it returns the next random numbers. Like that, I call five random numbers, one after other, 
and print them on the terminal. After that, in the later part of this program, I am getting other object of the same algorithm. The same algorithm, I get another object called SR2. So this SR2 object also initiated with the seed as you may see. So for that, I use the same process. So usually this is the recipient side. Recipient should know the same password of the sender to be encrypt and decrypt the data in between. So with the password, I call the get byte method and initiate the seed. So after that, here I also print five consecutive random numbers. So what I want to show you the random number generated by SR1 object and also the random number generated by SR2 object is same. Since they are initiated, initiated by the same seed. So let me run this program in that editor. So there you might see uh, it generates same sequence of five num random numbers twice. So in the, this is the first for loop for this random generator five times. So first random number, second random number and so on. So in the second generator also generate sequence of random numbers. So you see in the first set and the second set is similar. Why they are similar? They start with the same seed. Okay, let me now change the seeds. So first random number seeded by random number generator seeded by one, two, three, four. Second one seeded by one, two, three two initial values. So because of that, so these two instances will return two different random numbers. So as you see, this is the first cause, first five cause of SR1. So this is the first five call of SR2. So since seeds are different, so we get completely different set of random numbers. So those random numbers can be used as session keys in our application. Okay. By stopping our discussion there, I, move, I will move on to hash calculation. Let me start the lecture and go a little bit before I do in the demo hash. I shall back my action. So we discuss how to generate random numbers. Now let's see how we can calculate the message authentication code and hash codes. So hash for the message authentication algorithms are one-way algorithms. Perhaps you remember my first semester lectures. So we have the data to be feeded to the hash or Mac, hash or Mac algorithm. It creates a short code. So those, by looking at this code, we can get back the message. As you know, hash has the one-way property. So we will learn how to calculate such hash values or MAC values in our Java applications. So in order to calculate hash values, so Java has two types of classes available. So both of them are static classes. Simple category called as message digest class. Other category, it as message digest stream class. 
So when you want to calculate hash values of a short data, we use message digest class. If you want to calculate the hash value of data streams, such as files, we use message digest stream class. So what is the difference between these two classes? In the message digest class, we feed the data as we wish, one block at a time. And finally, I can call it hash method, which returns the hash values of the data which I feed it. So in contrast to that, message digest stream class create the stream of uh, a file, or in other words, it's listen the stream of file. And while listening to a stream, it calculate hash of this particular stream. So for example, if some data moves through the network, so we can calculate hash of the data. So if you have files stored in a large file stored in OHLIS, you can use this uh, message that is string class. Let's see how message digest class works. In the message digest class, again, first thing we need to do it in any cryptographic operation is to call get instance method. In the get instance method, we have to pass the algorithm name and it returns the object of this particular algorithm. Implementation of the object. So then, we call this message digest methods, get instance, with the algorithm name. It returns me the object called MD of particular data type. So then our data need to be uploaded using update method. So later on, you can call uh, digest methods to read the data hash of the data which is uploaded to this particular object. So as you know, hash algorithms, we have different uh, sets of hash algorithms available. The length of a hash basically depends on the length of the algorithm. The last operation of calculation in hashes is uh, digest method which returns the hash value. All right. Now let's have a look on the verification. In the verification side, we have to follow the similar steps. First of all, we have to get the instance of the same algorithm. And then we update the data to this algorithm and call the digest methods. The data need to be updated always using binary or the byte array. This update method not taken the strings. So all other places, if you are using regular data file, not showing this example as, uh, not showing it as a text, it, it, it's generalized. Right. Additional method in the verification phase is SQL. SQL methods compares the new digest with the original digest. And if it is true, no one alter the hash values of the digest. If it is false, hash or the digest has changed over time. Similarly, message digest class has three classes. So using that stream classes, we can uh, read and write files. While we are reading and writing at the background, we have to get the hash of the data stream. All right. Uh, let's have a look on the demo on hash calculation. So I'll stop sharing the presentation and then share the 
atom hydrogen right so in this i have several examples uh, i take uh, one simple example at the beginning right there there i have a class called a uh, simple hash as you know on the top of that i am including the java security package and the data to be said is hello and it's a string so in order to process in the hashing algorithm that string need to be converted into the byte array so that's why from this string variable called data i call the get bytes method it returns the binary data of the binary uh, value of the data so this example hello after that i get the instance of this algorithm where i want to use so in this example such a one and then i update the data here is my data using update method i update that data into this implementation of algorithm then in this method it returns a uh, hash value so these lines will print that hash on the terminal similarly assume Uh, for simplicity i create hash calculation and verification on the same program so but in practically these two need to be two different programs so assume now the recipient receive a data so this example it receives the data correctly so that's stored in a string array called uh, data2 and then i have to get the same algorithm in these lines i am loading the same algorithm into the memory so let me run the program so you see in the first round when i run that it create the sh1 hash data so that is hello we we assume the recipient also receive hello so then if we repeat the same actions here so it create the same hash values so message that this class has uh, another method call is equal using this is equal method we can compare original digest with the new digest so since both messages are same then the digest would be same so you see it actually on the screen let's assume sender transmit the hello and recipient receive this so in that particular situation if the system calculate I show the digest values and verify them. We verify it, then it should fail. As you see, it say digest verification fail. Why? This message and the this message is different. So that's how we calculate the. hash of a simple data let's assume we want to calculate a hash of a file file may be a, a string a text file or binary file it doesn't matter 
in order to do such calculation, I calculate, I, I, I wrote two examples called make hash and verify hash. So let's have a look in my make hash program. In this make hash program, what I do, I first create a message digest instance and the type of that, assume as a J1. So in this streaming, it's very interesting. In the streamings, which we, 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 we connect one pipe after other, and then we call the methods available in the top of the file. So then that request goes towards the bottom. And if your providers are capable of handling it, it gives me an answer. If that algorithm implementation is not available, so then it returns error. So as you see, I am get the instance of hashing algorithm. That is SHA. And here I am loading a file for reading. So my file name there is ES. So it loads into the memory. So after that, I create a buffer array by giving this file pointer to the constructor. So it returns the byte array of, which is called as BIS. So after that, I wrap that into the data, data input stream, and I pass this byte array. and call the, the digest input stream. So after we do the, all those steps here, which links low level call to the upper level call. And what we have to do is then do this. There you see there is a while loop, and in the while loop, I read entire data set. So then what happened? While we are reading this data at the background, some other module will calculate the hash values. So actually calculating hash is such simple as. So only thing is we need to arrange from the file system to the digest into string. So file name is mapped to this object. And by giving this object, I create an object called BIS. Then using that, I create an object. I create an object called DIS. So the last one is digest input stream. Right. After we creating such digest values, we need to save them. So in order to save that, I use this method. And finally, whatever someone record at the, uh, finally, whatever the data we calculate stored in the hash txt file. So you see it's digest updated here, and that value hash saves here. So there is a file created called hash txt. So that stores this hash value. So that's how hash calculated. Now let's have a look how this verification works. 
In this verification, we have to follow the same step. So we get the same instance of the algorithm. And then I create a file input stream and I load link into the buffer input stream. And finally, I link into the digest input stream. And finally, I'm creating a, a calling a method in the digest input stream. So what I call is just this. So in the right book, I read it, I find. So at the background, system will calculate the hash. So that's how it works. So the thing what system calculated can take it out by calling the digest method of this update class. So my original hash value is stored somewhere in the text file. So then I load this text file and using this method here, I compare the original with the new one. So obviously uh, in this make cache, I use erase.txt, then verify hash. Actually, I must do the same. So let me execute and show how it works. Mm -hmm. In the make cache, it shows hash updated. File we are passing for calculation is er erased. So here then I verify hash function. I calculated the hash value here. So it says digest verification fail. So in the make cache, uh, I use, I have to use same algorithm. Let's say I'm defined, I'm using, and then I calculate in the hash value and update it. Verify hash, I use the same algorithm and update that. So it's say verify. But the file name, I'm using the verification called hello exe. File name, I'm using for that. Is it so you see even these two different files creating the same hash that call it as hash collision. So MT5 considered as weak hash algorithm. So it's hash collisions is possible. So let me change the hash value to SHA, SHA1 then in the make hash and then SHA1 one in the verify as well. So I again calculate the hash value and then I verify it. So you see now it's a verification pair because it's two different programs, SSJ. So here I pass erase for calculating and pass hello for verification. So let's say I do verification with the erase method, same methods. They are, it's say verify. If the same algorithm, same file, and same algorithm, same file, so then digest should be verified. So that's how we can calculate and verify hash of a file. So let me back to the uh, lecture. So far we calculated hash calculation. Similarly, as you know, we can convert hash into the what you call it as hash mac or the hmac. 
difference between hash and HMAC is HMAC uses a security key. So there are few MAC algorithms. That is any block cycle in CBC mode and or some other mode. So same time we can convert any hash algorithm into the MAC as well. So if you do so, that call it as HMAC. Uh, so let's assume we want to calculate uh, HMAC values. Uh, I will show some example okay. and share my atom editor and take uh, HMAC example for the hash map. Yeah. So let me close those. So this is my HMAC example. So at the beginning, as you see, we are importing necessary security packages. And then I have a string some word, assume that is a password of hash calculation or HMAC, T for HMAC algorithm. So here I'm using a HMAC algorithm SHA256. So in other words, I am converting SHA256 into the HMAC. So that name it as HMAC256. So I have the password here. So I get bytes of this password and fix that as a security key for HMAC2 SHA256. So this is a security key for hash calculation then. Then I get instance of the same algorithm, you see, same algorithm. So then that is called as, object is called as MAC1. So I initial this HMAC with the seed here, key, initial key. Then my HMAC object is ready to accept data. So my data is this, hello Kasu. I get byte of this data and call the method available in this HMAC object. The method is called do find. So I directly call the method do find with the data. It returns me the HMAC values. So I just print them on the then assume this is a recipient site where we want to verify the HMAC value. Uh, there I feed the same password and I take it as E2 and get instance of the same algorithm and assume I received this message and I call do final with this message and it returns the HMAC values at the recipient side. So I printed them on the terminal and using this comparison, I compare the hash one for the HMAC one and HMAC two together. Uh, let me now run that. So it said I just verified. Let's say I change the password. So for example, this is the password of the sender side and assume recipient side has a different password. And then my runner, you see it tells us verification pair because we use two different passwords. One side we are using uh, one password in the other side we are using a different password. 
All right. Uh, so uh, let me fix back the parser. Uh, that is UCSC. So when it compiles, uh, it returns, it say verifies. Uh, and let me change the message thing. So in this side, it has this message and verify as I assume we receive this message. And when we compare it, you see it's a verification failed. Because it is two different messages. So output of HMAP depend on the parser and the data board. So you see it confirms by running this example. Right. Uh, let me back to the list then. The next example I am going to show you is digitally signing a message. So a data signature goes with public key cryptography. As you remember, they are we need to generate public private key pair. There are several public key cryptographic algorithms available. Among that, RSA are most popular. And then we are using elliptical cryptographic algorithms as well. So this, some of these public key cryptographic algorithms used for digitally signing messages plus encryption and decryption. Uh, but here we are showing you how to use public key cryptography to digitally sign the message. So for simplicity, I am assuming we are using RSA. RSA implementation or RSA algorithm. So signing, you see, remember, signing is a combination of hash and encryption of the hash. So if you want to sign a big document, we need to pass it to the hash algorithm and it create a hash value. So then we pass this hash value to the signing algorithm. So that gets a key. And signing means basically encrypting this hash using a security key. So after encrypted produced the signature object. How do you do that? In order to do that, Java has a key pair generator class. This key pair generator class will generate public private key pair. So we usually sign a message using the private key. So public key will be used to verify the signature. So steps we need to do is first I generate key pair. And then we create a object called signature object with the private key, initial value private key. Then we call the update method available in this signature object. So update method method will feed the data. So after we update all the data, we call the sign method. It returns the signature byte. So verify side, it should do the same. If these two digest are equal, the digest verification. If these two are equal, that means that verification successful. So as I mentioned, public private key will be generated by KPI generator class. So we can use different algorithms to generate those key pairs. So then the key pair object has 
two methods called get private and get public key. As it name says, get private key returns the private key of the pair and get public key returns the public key of this key pair. These are the summary. Get the instance of the algorithm, initialize the key, generate the key pair, get the instance of the signing object, and initialize it. Using init method, that's take signature creation takes private key. And here it shows verification, basically verification. Here it shows verification, verification takes the public key. The verification also, first of all, get the instance of this hash algorithm uh, instead of this uh, uh, signing algorithm. So I forgot to mention, you see here, in the, when you define the signing algorithm, we should define the hashing algorithm name with the public key cryptography algorithm. It's a SHA one with DSA. That means secure hash algorithm with the DSA. Similarly, we can have SHA one with RSA, SHA one with elliptic curve and so on. So signing is the combination of hashing and the public key. So this is creation of the signature. So how do you create? Create a key pair, initialize it with the private key and update the data and call the sign method available in the signature object. It returns the signature byte. Then what should we do for verification? So in the verifier side, public key, corresponding public key should be available and then it get the SHA a same algorithm and it initialized then with the public key, not the private key, public key. And then it update the signature method update with the bytes and it call the verify method with the signature returns. The verify methods tells okay or fail. If get okay, see, Signature verified, it fail, obviously, signature verification fails. So that's how we can calculate the digital signature and verifies it using Java. With that, I would like to conclude the first part of the lecture. Uh, let me show the demonstration. That is signature creation and verification. I will share the my editor again and uh, take this signature sample. This is how we can calculate the sig simple signature. So you see, first of all, it gets the instance of the public key algorithm. Here we are getting RSA and it initialize, uh, it create the key generator object, key pair generator object actually, because we're going to generate two keys. So then it initialize with the key size, feeding a random number. So then it called the generate key pair method, which returns public private key for me. So after that, I get the instance of this signature object, the algorithm SHA1 with RSA. So from this KPI, I get the private key out and initialize the signature object for signing. So this is my message to be signed. I get the byte of this message and update it to the signature object. Then I call the sign method it returns the signature bytes. Similarly, assume this is 
verification also happens on the same side. Uh, so I get the public key and initialize the verification of the signature object and assume verify receive the same message. And I get bytes out of this message and update it. And call the signature.verify method with the initial signature values. When I do so, it returns the true or false. Let me run that uh, to see whether what's happened. So you see it's called signature verification phase. Why? So we calculate the signature with this message and here we verify the signature. You see question mark is missing at the verifier side. So now these both sides has the same message. So I execute that. So now it says signature verification succeeded. So that's how we calculate the, and verify the digital signature. Before ending the session, let me show you, uh, let me go back to the provider example. So as you may remember at the beginning, I list down the set of providers. Assume we want to implement our own providers. So if you want to do so, that's here how we do that. So here you see, I create a class called UCSC provider. So it has my own set of algorithms. So like RSA, SHA and so on. So name of those algorithms, I put it into the constructor class of the provider. Basically what I do, Java has a provider class, I extend that and create my own cryptographic provider or UCSC provider. It has those algorithms. I put long name, the short name of those algorithms. So then basically in this program, I just uh, add this provider to the same program and then I get the information of the provider and so on. So let my compile and run this program. You see it's created on security provider. So it has these algorithms. So actually, in order to use those algorithms, we need to implement those algorithms then. So I don't implement all of them, but I, uh, in order to do the demonstration, I will implement an algorithm called UCSCSHAUC. So, so that algorithm is implemented by the class called XO Digest. So XO Digest class, you see I given here. So in, if you want to implement uh, your own algorithms, you need to extend the particular class. So I am extending the message digest specification class to implement my own message digest algorithm. So there, I have to implement uh, engine classes, corresponding engine classes which calculate this hash values. So this is my own hashing implementation. So that just use simple X operation. Right. So I summarize, I have a provider. So that provider is have several algorithms. Among those I have implemented one of these algorithms. So then I have programs using those things. So where, what I do now? So you see, I'm creating a security provider, new security provider called UCSC provider. And using security add provider method, I add them 
to my environment. Then I have a data. I get bytes of this data and then calculate UCSC SHA hash, my own hash. And here I print that hash values. And again, I verify the hash here. So now let I run that. So you see, it says digest verification fail. Why it says that? See, say Kasun and Kasun here. Okay, here algorithm is different. You see, see SHA, the verification name. So it says uh, digest verifies. So my own UCSC digest has just two, one byte digest. So you see, it says digest verified. So this is my own algorithm. Similarly, what I want to show here, uh, so let's say some bad guy wants to cheat you. So since this dynamical model available, I can perhaps replace SHA with my own. So there what I need to do in the in my own UCSC provider, you see, I call the message that I just call SHA and give the same hash, my UCSC hash class name, I put it there. Then I have uh, XO digest, my own digest implemented and name it as UCSC SHA as well as SHA, standard SHA algorithm. Right. So then in this, my example where we use it, so I call SHA algorithm. And run that example. So you see, it take SHA standard hashing algorithm, create and verify the data. It works perfectly. So if someone want to cheat you, perhaps he can remove the existing implementation of SHA by calling remove provider method. In the remove provider method, I give the name Sun. So that is the basic SHA implementation is available with the Sun provider. I give the name Sun here that will remove the Sun provider. So as soon as I remove the sun provider, you may see system will fall back into my bogus SHA provider. Because there are two implementation of SHA algorithm available to this program. One from the sun, other one from the UCSC. UCSC has a bogus implementation of SHA. So the system first is for sun, and take it for the calculation. But if some attacker removes the sum dynamically somehow, so then it might fall back into the bogus implementation. So then it calculate a weak hash value with my own. Similarly, not only hash, we can let the system to fall back any, any algorithms since Java security or the architecture is flexible and dynamic. So we can have our own implementation at this. If our own implementations are weak, then we fall back into the weak implementations of algorithms. So with that remark, I would like to conclude that session today. May I show you how to handle the security providers, how to list down the providers in your platform, 
and also I show you how do you calculate hash value and verify those hash values and then I show you how do we convert hash to the HMAC algorithm using HMAC classes available. So the difference between hash and the HMAC is HMAC has the security key. Similarly, we can use signature classes to digitally signature message. There, are, there we have to use public key cryptographic algorithms such as RSA with the hashing algorithm. Finally, I show you how to write our own security providers and use them in these, in our applications. Okay, with that, I will conclude the first part of this Java cryptographic lecture. Let's meet back again with the second part later on.